Thank you. Good afternoon. Dear Mrs. Maryam Rajavi, President-elect, distinguished colleagues and friends, I would like to thank you, firstly, for this invitation and for this generous and warm reception. I am most grateful. Before making my substantive observations on my detailed report um, titled Atrocity Crimes and Grave Human Rights Violations that took place in the Islamic Republic of Iran during 1981, 82, and in 1988, which was published uh, just last month, I would like to express my thanks and appreciation to colleagues as well as to a number of organizations who have supported me in the completion of this report. I'm very grateful to my good colleague, uh, Mr. Mohammed Hanif Jazairi, to Mr. Tahir Bumruda, the JVMI, Amnesty International, Abraham uh, Bormond, uh, Abdurrahman Bormond Center, and Restad Collective. I thank the now over 340 distinguished leading international experts and organizations for generously supporting my work and for being signatories to the recent open letter to the United Nations High Commissioner on Human Rights. Finally, I would also like to thank the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights and all colleagues at the UN who despite considerable challenges, supported me in the completion and publication of this important landmark report. I thank everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Colleagues, um, as you would note, my report examines the atrocity crimes that took place from the 1979 revolution Although there is an obvious focus on the crimes committed during 1981-82 and with an important detailed examination of the 1988 massacre. In my report, I have detailed the summary, arbitrary and extrajudicial executions of thousands of arbitrarily imprisoned political opponents amounting to the crimes against humanity of murder and extermination. There is also a detailed consideration of the crimes against humanity of torture, persecution, and enforced disappearances and other inhumane acts intentionally causing great suffering to the mental and physical health of the political prisoners. The executions included those of women, some of them reportedly raped before their executions and also a very large number of children who were executed. I have also analyzed the sexual and gender-based crimes against women and girls, as well as the persecution of religious, ethnic, and linguistic minorities during the first decade of the establishment of the Islamic Republic in 1979. Now, focused on the 1988 massacre, the report examines the systematic and widespread attack on a civilian population, resulting in mass murder, summary, arbitrary, and extrajudicial executions, as well as enforced disappearances of thousands of political prisoners between July to September of 1988. Today, as we speak, it is 36 years since the tragedy, and yet, the crime of enforced disappearances have continued. An overwhelming majority of the executed persons were members and sympathizers of PMOI, although hundreds of individuals belonging to leftist political groups and organizations were also forcibly disappeared and executed. 
there is considerable evidence that mass killings, torture, and other inhumane acts against members of the PMOI were conducted with genocidal intent. And here I endorse the comments made by uh, my previous uh, speaker, Mr. Lewis, and I'm very grateful to him for what he just said. The case for genocide against members of the PMOI rests, in my view, on the basis that the perpetrators of this crime perceived members of the group as munafikin. For these perpetrators, members of this group had become deviants. They had deserted Islam and were waging war against Islam. In so far as the Iranian theocracy was concerned, PMOI was perceived as a religious group albeit a deviant and heretical group with legitimate religious justification of mass executions, torture, mental and physical harm to members of this group. In addition to the mass murder, summary, arbitrary and extrajudicial executions, as well as enforced disappearances of thousands of political prisoners, evidence received confirms that political prisoners who were executed, and those who survived the massacre suffered from the most severe forms of physical and mental torture and other cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. These constitute crimes against humanity, and as mentioned, the crime against humanity of enforced disappearances remains a continuing crime until the fate of the disappeared persons and the facts remain uncleared. The victims, thousands of them, were buried in secret and unmarked individual and mass graves across Iran. And the perpetrators to the great tragedy of all of us have thus far evaded accountability and justice. Moreover, the families of the victims continue to be denied the right to, to know the truth they are not able to obtain a closure as the authorities refuse to clarify the faith of the victims and disclose the whereabouts of their remains, which means that the victims of the 1988 massacre remain forcibly disappeared. What I have called the atrocity crimes, in particular the 1988 massacre, represent the commission of the worst and the most egregious human rights abuses of our living memory, whereby high-ranking state officials connived, conspired, and actively engaged to plan, order, and commit crimes against humanity and genocide against nationals of their own state. Notwithstanding the availability of overwhelming available evidence, to this day, those with criminal responsibility for these grave and most serious violations of human rights and crimes under international law remain in power and in control. The international community has been unable or unwilling to hold these individuals accountable. Indeed, as we have heard already, many of these individuals implicated in these atrocity crimes and the 1988 massacre continue to enjoy the official governmental privileges and impunity from international justice and accountability. Distinguished participants and colleagues, in completing my report, which you have seen um, and was published last month, amongst the many challenges that were presented to me was this central question as to why I'm looking back at what many people or many critics said, apparently historic crimes. But as I studied the subject, and as my study has confirmed, these are not historic crimes, but they are continuing crimes within international law. And I will give you just three key elements of that, right? Firstly, as I've mentioned to you, the crime of enforced disappearance of thousands of persons is a crime, is a continuing crime in international law that remains a crime against humanity 
as long as the perpetrators continue to conceal the fate of the disappeared persons and the facts remain uncleared. In innumerable cases, families of those forcibly disappeared, disappeared continue to search for their loved ones, and I have met many of them throughout my investigation and through the testimonies that I received. They are looking for their loved ones. They're searching for their loved ones as the authorities persist in violating their rights, including their continual harassment and mental and physical torture and abuse. The second point that I make is that survivors of these crimes are victims of continuing crimes. Physically and mentally tortured, they continue to suffer in pain and distress. They also remain in immeasurable grief and an undeniable victimhood presents a living testimony to these atrocities. They are, they are living human beings. As survivors mentioned to me in their testimonies, they're all faced with mental and physical trauma on a perpetual basis as they search for a dignified, respectful, and humane closure to their daily suffering and pain. Many testified that this trauma has been passed on to their families and indeed to their younger generations, and they cannot live normal lives, even the young ones who did not see these atrocities themselves, but they can sense it, they can feel it through their older generations. All of them are victims who look towards the international community and who look towards the international experts to find truth, justice, and accountability. Thirdly, if I may add this point, and this is a very important contemporary issue, Analyzing the events of the first decade after the 1979 revolution provides an important insight and connection with the current day egregious violations of human rights and crimes under international law. For example, the raison d'etre of the Women Life Freedom Movement commencing, as you know, in September 2022 can be traced back to the resistance to enforced whaling by women in 1979 and in the 1980s in response to the oppression to which they were subjected after the revolution. The continued application, the, the continued application of the various arbitrary and unjustified laws that we see, the various uh, provisions of the constitution of the Islamic Republic of Iran along with the currently applied arbitrary and overbroad national security offenses, such as Muharrabe, which has been mentioned already, which means waging war against God, Afsad Filad, which means spreading corruption on earth, which the Iranian authorities continue to use to execute protesters and other dissidents. And we have heard and, and seen uh, the videos relating to that. The perpetual executions of those arrested as children, as well as the institutional structures through which human rights violations are weaponized and instrumentalized, including through the Islamic Revolutionary Courts. These were all conceptualized, devised, and implemented during this period. Yeah. Indeed, my view is that had the atrocity crimes of the 1980s, and in particular, the 1988 massacre, being prevented by timely intervention by the international community, we would not be witnessing the horrible crimes of today, in particular the large-scale executions in Iran. So, colleagues and distinguished participants, I would bring my presentation to a conclusion with a few brief points, if I may. Firstly, I ask the international community to establish an international investigative and accountability mechanism to conduct prompt, impartial, thorough, and transparent investigations into the crimes under international law, and together consolidate and preserve evidence with a view towards future criminal prosecution of all the perpetrators. 
I also say that the International Accountability Mechanism must investigate the atrocity crimes committed in 1981, 82, and in 1988 against thousands of political opponents of the authorities, in particular the mass, summary, arbitrary, and extrajudicial executions amounting to the crimes against humanity of murder and extermination, and the continued concealment of the fate of political opponents and the whereabouts of their remains, which amounts to the crime against humanity of enforced disappearance. Additionally, and secondly, the proposed mechanism must investigate the crimes against humanity of torture, of persecution, and other inhumane acts causing great suffering, serious injuries to the bodies and to the mental and physical health of the political prisoners, as well as the crime of genocide. Thirdly, this mechanism must conduct prompt and transparent investigations into the pattern of sexual and gender-based violence perpetrated against women and girls, including cases of, uh, reported cases of rape, as well as the repression, persecution, summary and arbitrary, and extrajudicial executions of ethnic, linguistic, and religious minorities. Fourthly, in addition to establishing an international accountability mechanism, I have called upon the international community to require the Iranian authorities to inter alia establish fully the truth regarding the mass enforced disappearances, extrajudicial arbitrary and summary executions, and genocide, provide reparations and all appropriate remedies to the victims, survivors, as well as to the families who were tortured, executed, or forcibly disappeared. I urge individual states, and the point has already been made, I urge individual states to exercise universal and other forms of extraterritorial jurisdiction in relation to crimes under international law committed by the regime by initiating adequately resourced criminal investigations, identifying those suspected of responsibility, including commanders and their superiors, and issuing, when there is sufficient admissible evidence, international arrest warrants. I will conclude by this point, that we must not engage with a regime whose leaders have committed atrocity crimes. The I will, I will just repeat that. We must not engage with a regime whose leaders have committed atrocity crimes. The international community must take concrete steps to end the continuing impunity within Iran, ensuring accountability, truth, justice, reparations, and remedies. I thank you.